The sudden and deadly attack by Japan on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, happened less than a year ago. At that time, the American military was getting ready to go on the offensive against German and Italian forces in North Africa. The early years of the British and American spy agencies, Operation Torch was the code name for the landings of the American forces in the West and the advance of the British 8th Army from the East. Together, they would push the Axis forces back into North Africa, finally driving them out. But at the same time that the military was getting ready for the attacks, there was a secret operation going on against Admiral John Darlin, who was in charge of the pro-German armed forces in France. It was only two months after the torch landings when Admiral Darlin was killed in a plot involving the British super-secret intelligence group MI6, also called the SIS, Secret Intelligence Service, and possibly the American Office of Strategic Services, OSS, which was run by William Wild Bill Donovan and was the equivalent of the CIA today. Along with General Charles de Gaulle, the leader of the Free French, and President Franklin D. Roosevelt, Prime Minister Winston Churchill of Great Britain, and others, they agreed in 1942 that the first large-scale offensive military campaign against the Germans would begin. The goal of this attack was to weaken the German positions in French North Africa. Landings were planned in Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia in order to open up a southern front for further landings in Europe and ease some of the pressure on the Eastern Front for the Soviet Union. France being occupied is a setback for the Allies. The fall of France to the Germans was a big setback for the Allies, and these important events happened after that. When Hitler's men came into Paris, the regular French army stopped being a real threat. After that, Hitler split the country into two separate parts. One was run by French allies and had its capital at Vichy. The Germans took over the other, which was mostly to the north and included Paris as its city. ADM. Jean Darlan, who was at the center of everything, walked into this very unstable mix. Darlan was in charge of the French Navy under the pro-German Vichy government. He was not friendly with the Allies, and over time Darlan would be the real Prime Minister of Vichy and be in charge of all the French troops in North Africa that were part of Vichy a co-worker with a fascinating family history. He was born in the French town of Nérac on August 7, 1881. The French government put his father in charge of law. One of his grandfathers was killed while in charge of a ship at the Battle of Trafalgar, which was a very important event in history. Jean finished from the prestigious Lycée St. Louis in Paris in 1899. He then went to the French Naval Academy and graduated in 1902. He was in charge of a group of marine guns during World War I. Through the French Navy, Darlan quickly moved up the ranks. By 1929, he was a rear admiral. After the Great War, when all the weapons were taken away, Darlan's first big job was to rebuild the French Navy. He personally oversaw the repair of the French fleet. In 1936, he was made chief of the Navy's general staff and was in charge of all French naval activities. He was one of the most powerful men in the French military at this point, and he made the most of it. Along with many other French soldiers in the years before World War II, Darlin didn't like anything British, even having to work with his British Navy colleagues. But when war clouds started to form in the late 1930s, he was told to work with the British. One way he was told to do this was to send French ships to help the Royal Navy in the Mediterranean. A lot of the most important politicians and soldiers in the French government hoped that Admiral Darlin hated the Germans more than he hated the British, Admiral Darlin doesn't waste any time getting power. At the very least, Darlin was a great opportunist, and he showed what he really was soon after France fell in June 1940. With France in his hands, the Führer put Marshal Philippe Pétain in charge of the government in Vichy. Pétain was just a figurehead who did what his German bosses told him to do. Darlin was given a lot of power by Pétain's government. Uh, the most important of these was command of the large French fleet, which was still mostly unharmed by the war. Later, the British Royal Navy took strong action that hurt parts of the French fleet 
and gave the Allies confidence that these ships would not fall into German hands. When the Allies attacked North Africa in 1942, Hitler was furious. He broke the peace deal he had made with Vichy in 1940 and took steps to take over all of France. Darlin was sure that the Germans would win the war, and he did everything he could to keep Hitler happy with the Vichy government. Darlin had two new jobs by 1941. He was Minister of the Interior and Minister of Defense. Vichy's strategy was to help the Germans as much as possible. They even let them use the former French colonies, which had important strategic locations and raw materials. Darlin works both sides to his benefit and danger. The United States Roosevelt administration learned about secret Vichy activities in Central and South America from the OSS. Vichy spies were said to have sneaked into the Caribbean island of Martinique and were then roaming the area while the port was being used by German U-boats to refuel. Even though Darlin felt sorry for the Germans, he refused to fully cooperate and got in touch with the U.S. in the months before Operation Torch. It was all going on at the same time that he was named Pitan's replacement on February 10th, 1941. It was now like Darlin was playing both ends against the middle when he dealt with the Germans and the Allies. In October 1941, he went to French Algeria and told his Navy troops to defend Dakar, Senegal, against any attack by the Allies. At the same time, the skipper talked to the Americans and told them he was ready to work with them when the torch landings happened. Robert Murphy, a U.S. ambassador, talked to Darlin and the Admiral's son, Alain, who was an officer in the French Navy. In early 1942, in April 1942, Murphy met young Darlin and another officer for the first time. When Murphy got back to Washington, he told the president that the two Frenchmen were excited to work with the U.S. on the planned invasion of North Africa and would join the Allies when the time was right. Through a cable, Murphy told his family, I was greatly encouraged by their apparent eagerness, sincerity, and desire for Franco-American collaboration. Ike makes the smart choice not to trust the French. Unfortunately, Alan Darlin got polio out of the blue while he was stationed in Algiers. In a short amount of time, the Admiral would make several trips to be with his sick son and meet with Murphy and Major General Mark Clark, who was General Dwight D. Eisenhower's assistant during the important torch period. Murphy didn't give out information about how big Operation Torch was or where the attacks were, but he told General Eisenhower that all information about Torch should be given to the French troops in order to win their trust. Eisenhower turned down the idea and told Murphy that the French would get the information to the Germans within days of hearing about it. Ike told Murphy to lie to the French Navy officers and tell them that the invasion was supposed to happen in February 1943. America angers de Gaulle by recognizing Darlin. Washington chose not to tell General de Gaulle's free French forces about the date and time of the torch invasion, which made things even more complicated. Because de Gaulle had spoken out against the U.S.'s diplomatic recognition of the Vichy government, President Roosevelt didn't trust or like him. People in Washington and London chose to stick with Admiral Darlin because he was the less bad option. Looking back, it was likely the wrong thing to do. The situation involving Darlin showed how weak the bond between the U.S. and the Free French really was. It turned out that after France was freed, de Gaulle would become the most important politician in the country. From London, de Gaulle begged the U.S. for more supplies for his resistance force. This started a competition between the U.S. and British Secret Services to see who could give the most supplies. De Gaulle was very angry at General Eisenhower and the United States when Ike chose to recognize Darlin as the political and military leader of France, with Washington's OK. When the U.S. recognized Darlin, de Gaulle stopped the OSS from working with his own intelligence service as a way of insult. Because of what happened with Darlin, the British and the pro-allied French rallied around de Gaulle, putting the U.S., at least for a short time, in the cold, caught and then quickly set free. From the time that allied troops arrived in North Africa, Darlin was the most important politician. His secret service officers in Algiers told him that the invasion was about to happen, so he waited in that very old city for things to happen. 
He didn't have to wait for very long, it turned out. Darlin was told 24 hours ahead of time that the invasion was going to happen. On his way to tell Vichy about it, he was arrested along with General Alphonse Jouin, who was in charge of the land and air troops in French North Africa. They were arrested by Henri Dastier, a handsome military officer who was in charge of the Chantiers de la Jeunesse, the Young Workmen, a well-known French underground resistance force. Dastier's troops also took over the police stations and the radio station in Algiers, where the two men were being held. These steps were taken by Dastier a little too quickly, just hours before the invasion started. When the Allies came in, they didn't help him, and the French army loyal to Vichy drove his troops away. Soon, both Juin and Darlin were set free. The Americans make a tough offer to turn down. After he was freed, Darlin quickly talked to leaders of the Allies and told the Americans that the only person he would talk to was General Eisenhower. Eisenhower turned down Darlin and sent Major General Clark instead. It was planned that Darlin and Clark's meeting would have long-lasting military and political effects on both sides of the war. Clark told Darlin what he wanted to say right away. He said that President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill were ready to work with him as the French government's main political and military spokesperson, but only if he agreed to their specific terms. The French troops in Tunisia had to stop fighting right away, and the Admiral had to promise not to get in the way of the Allied landings. If Darlin accepted, the Allies would forget about his not-so-secret ties to Vichy and the Germans for a while and give him control over the civilians in French North Africa. He was also made High Commissioner in French North Africa, the sudden and unexpected end of the French Navy. As soon as Darlin agreed to the terms set by the Allies, he told all Vichy men in North Africa to stop fighting. Also, he told the French fleet in the port city of Toulon to leave and join the Allied force. Darlin's instructions about the Toulon fleet were not followed, which was a shame. Instead, Admiral Jean Laborde, who was in charge of the area around Toulon, told the fleet to be destroyed so that it wouldn't fall into German hands. It was planned to sink one battleship, two cruisers, four heavy cruisers, three light cruisers, 24 destroyers, and 10 subs. The so-called Darlin deal stopped the battle between the Allies and the French, which made it possible for the landing on the coast of North Africa to go well. There was good news about the troops, but there was also a lot of anger around the world about the agreement with Darlan. In the United States, there is a political firestorm. A lot of protests came from politicians on both sides of the Atlantic. There was one main question they had. Why were the Allies working with someone who had openly helped the Germans? Donovan of the OSS was one of the first people to speak out against the Darlan plan. According to Donovan, identifying Darlin with our actions in North Africa causes problems that can't be ignored. He wrote this in a letter to his customers, who were most likely the President, Secretary of State Cordell Hull, or the Joint Chiefs of Staff. These problems don't go away whether Darlin forced himself on us, someone else forced him on us, or we made a deal with him on our own. No matter how we got here, we have to get rid of Darlin's political leadership which will affect the French people and our ability to win the war. We have a lot of power over the French people because we are strong and honest. It is clear that if things keep going the way they are, our traditional stance will become weaker. We must not wait too long to find an answer. What Churchill and FDR knew about mail. Roosevelt and Churchill both didn't trust Darlin, which is clear from their letters, which were first released in Churchill's wartime memoir, The Hinge of Fate, 1950. From the start of the war, both leaders wrote each other very private and personal letters that were only known to each other. The former naval person, um, Churchill, wrote to Roosevelt on November 17, 1942, saying, I ought to let you know that very deep currents of feeling are stirred up by the arrangements with Darlin. This letter shows how worried the British leader was about Darlin's rise to power. The more I think about it, the more sure I am that it can only be a short-term fix that is only acceptable because of the stress of fighting. We shouldn't forget that the idea that we are ready to make peace with the local Quislings, Darlin, could do a lot of political damage to our cause, not just in France, but all over Europe. Darlin had a bad history. 
he gave the French Navy its bad attitude by putting his own people in charge. Just yesterday, French soldiers were sent to their deaths to fight against your line of battle off of Casablanca. Now, Darlin is pulling a fast one for power and office. Roosevelt replied to Churchill's letter about his feelings about Darlin on November 18th, 1942. I, too, have felt the strong emotions that come with Darlin. I thought I needed to act quickly, so I just told the press what I think, and I hope they take it at face value. I agree with the political plans that General Eisenhower made for Northern and Western Africa for now. I fully understand and agree with the views of the United States, Great Britain, and other UN members that, given what has happened over the past two years, no long-term deal should be made with Admiral Darlin. In the same way, people in the UN would never understand why the Vichy government would be recognized again in France or any other French country. We don't agree with French people who back Hitler and the Axis. Darlin tries to make his actions seem like they are helping his allies. ADM. Darlin, for his part, knew that his deal with the Allies was only temporary and didn't think much about it. The Western forces were able to win the war in French North Africa thanks to the deal with the Allies. A letter Darlin wrote to Major General Clark shows how he felt about working with the Allies. Maitre Le General, information from different sources supports the idea that I'm just a lemon that Americans will throw away after they have squeezed it dry. I only did what I did because the American government truly promised to restore the integrity of French sovereignty as it existed in 1939, and because the armistice between the Axis and France was broken by the occupation of metropolitan France, which Marshal Patin sincerely protested. I did what I did not out of pride, ambition, or greed, but because it was my job to do so as a citizen of my country. Once the integrity of France's sovereignty is clear, and I hope that will happen as soon as possible, I fully intend to return to my private life and end my days of dedicated service to my country in retirement. The way things turned out, Darlin's hope for a peaceful retirement would never come true. A man who was hated and distrusted by everyone by December 1942, everyone who cared, could see that Admiral Darlin was a target. It would take a record to keep track of all the different kinds of people who were against him. Because he had made a deal with the Germans before, the Allies didn't believe him. The Germans thought he was a traitor because he told them to destroy the French ships and made the deal with Eisenhower. De Gaulle's free French forces saw him as a rogue too and wanted to get rid of him at all costs. The guys who worked for the British Secret Service in London gave the Darlin case their top priority. When the Germans took over the Vichy zone in France, it was much more dangerous for resistance groups to fight a secret war against the German occupiers. What happened to Darlin at lunch? At the end of the Toulon fleet incident, Sir Alexander Cadogan, who was in charge of the foreign office, said of Darlin, the Americans and naval officers in Algiers are letting us in for a pot of trouble. We shall do no good until we have killed Darlin. On December 8, 1942, Cadogan met with Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden, General de Gaulle, and a General Catreau at the Savoy Hotel to talk more about what to do about Darlin. When the subject of Darlin's fate came up at the meeting, de Gaulle said, get rid of Darlin. Yes, is my answer, but how? Ahead of the Savoy lunch, the men were talking about the Darlin problem, but they had no idea that preparations were already being made to kill him. As a result of Darlin's takeover, many prisoners were freed. Bonnier de la Chapelle was a Frenchman who was among them. Chapelle backed the Comte de Paris because he thought he should be the real king of France. During the war, Chapelle joined the Chantier de la Jeunesse, a secret group led by Henri Destier. The Free French were linked to this group, which helped the Allies when they arrived at H. Hour. After that, Bonnier de la Chapelle joined the Corps d'Afrique, a paramilitary group that was a special unit intended to use all elements in French North Africa, politically active French subjects, non-French refugees, natives, and Jews under restrictions. A professional group of spies in North Africa, Aintaya, near Cape Marifu, 
and not far from Algiers, was where the Corps d'Afrique trained. The SOE, Special Operations Executive, a British spy agency, ran this important place, which made it stand out. When the Nazis took over Europe, it was the SOE's job to set Europe ablaze with strikes from below. Sir Stuart Menzies, who was in charge of British intelligence, was in charge of all secret activities, including the Corps d'Afrique. The SOE taught these fighters special war methods like sabotage, subversion, and using small arms. One of its teachers was Bonnier de la Chapelle. It was already a very tense place, but now there was another person involved. Not long after the Corps was created, Donovan sent one of his most trusted OSS spies, Carlton Kuhn, to watch the training. Kuhn was supposed to speak for the OSS and send back any information he thought was important. As a young man, Kuhn did anthropological work in North Africa, the Balkans, Ethiopia's old lands, and the Middle East. He taught at Harvard and joined the OSS during the war. In a strange move, the British cut ties with the Corps, leaving Kuhn and the OSS in charge. A priest, a young person, and a soldier plan an attack. There was a plan to kill Darlin in the Corps d'Afrique at the Aintaya base of operations, which Kuhn did not know, or at least said later he did not. Roger Rosfelder, Henri Dastier, and a soldier named Mario Favre were the people who planned the plot. Favre came up with the idea to kill Darlin from a car caravan along a route Darlin often took with a British-made Sten gun. Later, Rosefelder said it was all talk and that another man, a priest from the Church of St. Augustine called Abbe Cordier, who had secret ties to Dastier, had met Bonnier de la Chapelle, the killer in secret. Rosfelder says that Chapelle was so moved by the priest's speech against Darlin that he chose to make the hit. Abbe Cordier and Chapelle met on December 23, 1942, which was the day before Darlin was killed. After the meeting, Kuhn told Donovan that the priest gave Chapelle a choice of murder tools. The two men met on Christmas Eve 1942 in the Admiral's room at the Hotel Palais de Thé. Rosefelder, Fave, and another guy drove Chappelle to Darlin's hotel while the meeting was going on. Shots are fired in the Hotel Palais de Thé, killing one. Chappelle walked into the hotel without being stopped and shot Darlin at point-blank range with his Colt Woodsman gun. It's interesting that Chappelle's gun used to belong to Carlton Kuhn. Chappelle was arrested and taken into prison right away. Darlin was badly hurt, and he died later that afternoon. Chappelle was tried in secret and killed right away just two days after he was caught. Very bad. Very quickly. End of case. Even though Admiral Darlin died, the love story did not stop. Once the murder was over, claims and questions started to surface about whether or not the OSS and the SOE had anything to do with Darlin's death. What the pros and cons of an, an unholy arrangement are? The news that Darlin had been killed spread quickly through the capitals of the Allied forces. There must have been quiet Thanksgiving in both Washington and London that the problem with the traitorous skipper was solved. Back in Algiers, where the murder happened, things were moving quickly behind the scenes. When the president was killed, General Henri Giraud was put in charge of all French troops in North Africa. In his autobiography, Churchill wrote about Darlin's death. Darlin's murder, no matter how bad it was, freed the Allies from having to feel bad about working with him and gave them all the benefits he had given them during the most important hours of the Allied landings. Carlton Kuhn was in the city when Darlin was shot, but he quickly disappeared. William Eddy, a close friend of William Donovan and one of the most respected men in the OSS, was one of the first people Kuhn talked to after the murder. When Eddie was in charge of the OSS station in Algiers, he sent spies into French North Africa. As head of the OSS station, Eddie knew everything going on behind the scenes to get rid of Darlin for the Allies. The killing of Darlin serves as an example of a covert killing. Eddie warned Kuhn that after the Admiral's death, news would spread that the OSS had something to do with it. He said that people who were against the OSS would connect Chappelle to the OSS-run Corps d'Afrique, and more importantly, Kuhn to Eddie as his master. For Eddie, Kuhn had a darker side to him than an innocent person. Kuhn believed that politicians should be killed during battle. He wrote, therefore, there must be some other power, some third class of people besides the leaders and the scholars. This third class must be in charge of preventing mistakes, 
spotting areas where the world might not be in balance and stopping the causes of possible disturbances before they happen. It should be the job of a group of guys to throw out the rotten apples as soon as they start to turn brown. In order to keep the cops from looking into any possible OSS ties, Eddie told Kuhn to leave Algiers. Kuhn ended up with the SOE and put on a British captain's uniform. The new name he gave himself was Captain Rittenitis. Thoughts of a plot grow as rumors spread. Other strange things about Darlin's death included the fact that he was in the city when Sir Stuart Menzies, the head of British intelligence, was killed. As soon as the Admiral died, there were rumors going around among French soldiers that the British were responsible for the murder. It was said that the British also planned to kill other important people like General Eisenhower and Robert Murphy. Some people believe that the most strange thing about the events of November 11th is that Menzies, who was in charge of the British Secret Service, would leave his safe headquarters in London and be having lunch with his friends just a few miles away. The news of the murder didn't surprise Menzies and his group when they heard it. Menzies' personal assistant at the time, Patrick Riley, said some things that add to the puzzle of why he was in the area where Darlin was killed. In his writing, Riley said that Menzies asked him in December 1942, not long before the killing, if he would like to take a short sick leave. Riley took a holiday, and Menzies was in his office as usual when he got back. After the fact, Riley wrote that he didn't know that C had been away while he was gone. Was Riley's absence the right reason for Menzies to go to Algiers and handle the aftermath of the murder? De Gaulle takes over as a leader and clears the killer. But the killing had more twists and turns that no one saw coming. After Chappelle killed Darlan a year ago, many French leaders, led by De Gaulle and Giraud, held a minute of silence to remember the killer. It was ordered by de Gaulle that the sentence against Chappelle be thrown out a week later. An Algerian court said, documents were found that showed conclusively that Admiral Darlin had been acting against the interests of France and that Bonnier's act had been done in the interests of the liberation of France. Admiral Jean Darlin's removal from power was good for the United States, Great Britain, and the Free French, even if there wasn't a big plot to kill him. The Allies were in charge of all military and civil matters in North Africa, and de Gaulle was in charge of the resistance. The Allied troops now made it possible for the D-Day attack of France to happen two years from now. Darlin did more for the Allies after he died than he ever could have in life.